as you may, I hope, in fact, as you all know, we do make recordings of each of these lectures, and then they're available later either on podcasts or DVD. And so I forgot to give the nice person recording, Richard Patrone, the one-minute warning, but it looks like it's okay for me to now proceed. So, as I was starting to say, I'm Michelle Marinkovic, Associate Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education and the Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, and thank you so much for being here on one of the more beautiful days we've had lately to hear our speaker and to be here for the first in the series for this quarter. We're very fortunate to have the Walter A. Haas Professor in the Humanities, Russell Berman, who is also in German Studies and Comparative Literature and a Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, talking us today about rethinking liberal arts. And please do note there are some posters there in the middle of the table that three weeks from today we will have Professor Jean Oy of Political Science talking to us about effective teaching in the field, meaning of course not the discipline but uh, when you're actually in the site of what you are teaching, in Jean's case, China. So we hope you can be with us for that as well. Russell has an unusual breadth in both his scholarly interests and in his current and former administrative posts at Stanford that eminently qualify him to talk about rethinking the liberal arts. He also has an openness and an attentiveness to student culture and feedback that have made him especially thoughtful about the voluminous student data that have resulted from several recent studies of the introduction to the humanities, the requirement that he currently heads. So now I'd like to give you just a brief glimpse of his rich background and accomplishments. Russell finished his BA, magna cum laude, from Harvard in 1972, and then spent a year on a prestigious DAAD fellowship at, at uh, the University of Munich, returning to Washington University in St. Louis for his master's in 1976 and his PhD in 1979, both in German literature. He came to Stanford in the latter year as an assistant professor, was promoted to associate professor in 1985, and a full professor an impressively brief three years later in 1988. Though his was a very fast rise, I should add that it surprised no one since I was on campus at that time, and I remember the excitement that both Russell's arrival and his subsequent activities quickly generated. As noted, his interests and his publications have ranged broadly from his 1986 book, The Rise of the German Novel, to his 2004 book, Anti-Americanism in Europe, to his latest work, the intriguingly titled Fiction Sets You Free, Literature, Liberty, and Western Culture. Perhaps equally notable for the work of a scholar, and academic is that all of Russell's seven books are still in print and still available, including his first, Between Fontana and Tucholsky, and that's from way back in 1983. And his more than 100 articles, a number that you much more often see with scientists and engineers than with humanists, have appeared in a variety of top flight American and international journals, including many in German. Among his many distinguished honors are an endowed chair here at Stanford, the German Studies Association Award for the Outstanding Book in both 1988 and 2000, the Max Cotta Prize of the American Association of the Teachers of German, the Bundesverdienstkreuz of the Federal Republic of Germany, and an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship, and that isn't even the full list. I'm also delighted to point out that in association with all of these research awards, Russell won the Dean's Award for Distinguished Teaching in 1988 and the 2000 Hofer Prize Partnership Award for Teaching Undergraduate Writing. And since faculty nowadays must balance not only teaching and research, but in addition administration, 
Russell has managed to serve Stanford with distinction in such weighty roles as Director of Modern Thought and Literature Program, Chair of German Studies, Associate Dean of HNS, Cognizant Dean for Undergraduate Studies, Director of the Overseas Studies Program, and a currently Director of the Introduction to the Humanities Program. It's with great pleasure then that I introduce Professor Russell Berman, who demonstrates beyond all question that great service, great research, and great scholarship are to be found on this campus in happy and robust combination. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for that introduction. I'm a little humbled and can't really speak. You <laughs> left me, so uh, goodbye. Uh, uh, I'm glad to know that all those books are still in print and they'll be available for sale outside in the lobby. Um, I especially want to thank you for the poster that uh, reassures me beyond a shadow of a doubt that I made a right decision in shaving my beard. Uh, uh, OK. so. Um, uh, I'm um, here, I have a camera aimed at me, I have an audience, uh, I'm a professor, what more could I want? Uh, uh, and that's really a, a serious comment uh, in the sense that uh, I think that I and we in the higher education community still maintain a model of um, our activity uh, organized around the binary of the uh, professor, the fountainhead of knowledge, uh, disseminating it to the thirsty learners. Uh, and I think that's a problematic model. I'm not going to argue that it has absolutely no place, that it should be eliminated altogether, but really that's the, the core problem that I'm going to address uh, in, in different in different ways today. We've made a lot of progress toward thinking about learning processes and student-centeredness, if that's the acceptable term. Uh, but uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, it's real, we're, 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 we're hardwired to do things very, very differently, down to the, the organization of space uh, on, on, on the university campus through our, the organization of labor, that is departments. Um, and so forth, and maybe I'll get into some of that. But how I'd like to proceed is to talk a little bit about the Introduction to the Humanities uh, self-study that uh, we conducted last year and that is available on our program website for your perusal, should you like to look at it. Um, and then talk about some of the broader implication for the liberal arts. I think IHUM is uh, indisputably a uh, a flagship piece of our liberal arts education at Stanford, but it's certainly not the whole liberal arts education at Stanford. What we learned through the, through the IHUM self-study, IHUM, Introduction to the Humanities, uh, uh, has implications, I believe, for the liberal arts more broadly and to prompt all the members of the university community to wonder about what we're doing here. Um, for those of you, uh, not familiar with IHUM. This is the uh, three-quarter required freshman course. Uh, uh, all freshman uh, courses uh, that is open only to freshmen. Uh, currently it exists in the form of eight to ten parallel courses among which students choose. I'll talk about how we got there in a little bit. Uh, and. Uh, it's also organized in what was called the one plus two model. That is, admitted students are, um, choose an autumn quarter course that has an interdisciplinary nature. And in the course of their autumn, they select a winter spring uh, sequence. Um, that's just background. Um, let, me, let me talk about some of the results of the self-study. Um, then go on to the, uh, the wider implications, and after that, I'd be happy to talk about uh, IHUM, the self-study, or the, the bigger issues with you. Uh, okay, so this is a mandated self-study, part of the legislation. The Academic Council Senate uh, uh, decides the requirements for graduation. One of the key gr requirements for graduation is the completion of the freshman requirement, the Introduction to the Humanities. 
It's governed by a governance board. We report to the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education. Uh, and the legislation mandates regular self-study. So that's what we were doing. Um, and we polled faculty involved. We, invo uh, we polled uh, the fellows, the postdoctoral fellows who run the discussion sections. And we extensively polled uh, students and got an enormous, uh, uh, enormous amount of response. I guess we, our, our, the, the, a major piece of it was a, a, um, an online questionnaire to then current sophomores, juniors, seniors, asking them to think back to their freshman IHUM experience. Uh, so a cohort of about uh, 5,000, 5,500 uh, students, and we got about 1,400 responses. And of those 1,400 responses, nearly 900 not only gave us the quantitative, but it took the time to write, um, to write qualitative comments. And I got to read them all. And this was a really exciting opportunity to look under the hood of what's going on at, uh, at Stanford for, for undergraduates. Some of the results. Uh, it will surprise none of you familiar with undergraduate uh, culture or Stanford to learn that some students hate IHUM. Uh, what surprised me is that some students love IHUM and that, in fact, the numbers are effectively identical. That is, when you, when you, when, when, when you, when you look at them, it's about 13% at one end of the tail, 13% at the other end of the tail. Slight difference, 13.1 and 13.4. And then there's a bell curve in the middle. So that's, I re, that I regard as relatively good news because the buzz in the public culture at Stanford, the, the daily editorials, is, tend to be... Um, very negative. And that's really a disservice to the undergraduates. There are a lot who really like it. And 50% or more uh, like it to, to some degree or another. So the notion that there's massive student hostility to it is simply a, a caricature. There are some very vocal uh, 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 students who, who oppose it. And I took their criticisms very seriously. Uh, indeed, the the, uh, the bell curve result I didn't regard as all that much of good news because if we have a requirement, it should be better than, than, than equal distribution across the range. And especially if we're talking about the first experience at Stanford, it should be better than that. So we ought to do better than we're doing, but we weren't doing as bad as some people thought we were doing. All right? uh, now, we... Uh, We've made some, some tweaks in the program. I'll talk about one big piece of that uh, in, in a moment. But uh, I think, actually, we're doing better this year than last year. We did an informal uh, poll of students after the, uh, the, the autumn quarter. I wrote directly. This is not the mandated evaluation. But, but uh, I wrote directly to, uh, to, to students, asking them, uh, what they like, what they disliked, how they'd evaluate their, their experience. So this was a real um, doormat to anybody who wanted to vent. Right? This is where you really can get the cranks to come out of the closet and, and tell us, tell us you know, why, you know, why do you make us do this? We want to graduate quicker. We just want to do our stuff. And in fact, in fact we got very few responses. I think we got about a 20% return rate altogether, of which of which the bulk was positive. It was uh, 60 to 70 percent positive. The numbers of students who were responding negatively, even though this was, you know, here's the director of IHEM walking around with a kick me sign on my back. Uh, yeah, they didn't want to bother. Right? Uh, so I think that, that we've either made some positive, the, the, either there have been some positive developments or we've been able to get rid of some of the negatives. And I think actually both have happened. Um, before I get into that, uh, what, what we also reflected on is that while um, many members of the Stanford community think of IHUM as a relatively new program, people remember when it was instituted 10 years ago, in fact, it's part of a 90-year history. Right? As long as there's been undergraduate education with requirements, there's been a freshman requirement with a brief hiatus in the wake of the 60s. 
But this goes back to the 1919-1920 uh, the era, the same era in which the core was established at Columbia and Chicago. So those are the homologous curricula. Uh, that's what we should be, th th those are our peers. And in fact, we compete for some of the same, uh, same fellows to, te to teach in sections. But my point is that uh, if we start fiddling with it, uh, significantly, we shouldn't take it lightly. This is what's been going on at Stanford for a very, very long time. There have been student complaints about requirements for a very, very long time. Actually, if I, my history is right, the introduction of requirements and the introduction of tuition were pretty much contemporary, and there's been complaining of both, about both for a very, very long time, and probably rightly so. But that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about some arbitrary invention of 10 years ago. We're talking about something that Stanford faculty have thought of as important as a, as a, as a responsible piece of uh, education for, uh, for nearly a century. Uh, now, I compared us to uh, Columbia and uh, Chicago a moment ago. Um, I think that we, they have the advantage of imagining that they have a continuous traditional course. Um, we have the advantage of being brave enough to reinvent this every 10 or 20 years. And these are sometimes wrenching discussions, sometimes not wrenching discussions, but I don't think, I think we're actually better off than, than they are because they, on, on many scores, are just weighted down by this tradition, whereas we're able to develop um, a, a much more supple introduction to college-level learning than they are where they're still burdened with some of the canon debates of, uh, of 15 years ago um, really pointlessly. I mean, that's become a very tired topic, uh, and they're still in them. But since why have we been doing this for 90 years? And the answer that I come up with is that, the, that there's a structural function to this required freshman course. Each generation of faculty have imagined, here's a specific material that we want stu the students have to learn in order to be good, and you fill in the blank. But what was really going on was that this was a kind of ramp up from high school learning to college learning. And uh, and that remains actually indispensable. In fact, it remain, it, it's, it's, it's more important today than, than it may have been before for a reason I'll get to in a moment. But let me just dwell on this, this one point first. This, I, I distinguish between a, um, between, a, between a structural pedagogical function, a ramp up into uh, higher education, distinguish that from the specific contents that faculty in the 1920s, the 1940s, the 1960s thought that students had to know. Um, that's, that, that, that's, there, there's a lot that one could squeeze out of that. At various points in time, um, faculty have believed that it's crucial to, for, for students to learn the content of, well, this was originally the Problems of Citizenship course from the 1920s and 1930s. In the era of the Russian Revolution and the rise of anti-democratic movements, it was important to talk about a set of issues. It was actually, these were courses actually that had significant social science uh, participation in them. And the disappearance of that and the replacement by humanities is a whole other story in the development of American culture. Then it became Amer Western civilization. Then it became Western culture. Western culture was criticized for reasons of canonicity, et cetera. I think there's a way to look at all of that and see those ideological transformations as almost epiphenomenal to the pedagogical agenda. But to say that means that right now we're looking not at the, the, uh, the positive content of the specific courses, Many of, they all have wonderful positive contents, but we're, because we've opted for this multiple track model, we no longer have the authority of saying, you have to know this in order to become an educated person. You can become an educated person without knowing any this. Right? You have to know some this, but not this this. Uh, and and, and we, you know, we, we, we could, we, that, that's worthy of reflection. Right? And I, I think there are reasons uh, to be uncomfortable with that too, but I think it's where we are, and it does give us uh, a lot of flexibility. It allows us to offer courses that, that's among which students can choose, 
most students get their first choice. All students get their first or second choice unless they're choosing to, 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 to choose uh, uh, different courses that, um, that have schedule conflict. I can't solve you know, the uh, two places at the same time problem. Uh, uh, but where, where, so there's, a, there's, there's the advantage of uh, content-based instruction. Students get to read stuff they think they're interested in. Even though the student coming out of, out of high school may not really know what it means to choose a philosophy course or a religious studies course, et cetera. But they believe they're interested in this stuff. Uh, and that, we believe, um, encourages them to engage the material more, more energetically. Where, where, where sh the, the, the emphasis has been shifted again now from the positive knowledge to the the learning processes. Um, uh, that implies a kind of tension between the value of specific material and the value of uh, cognitive development, or between expertise and creativity. And uh, while I think we're on the right track here, we should focus on what it means to devalue expertise, and I'm going to come back to that uh, in a bit. So there's that, the, the, the structural pedagogical function of the first year requirement. Uh, another contribution that this first year requirement has made to Stanford uh, undergraduate education, I think from the start, don't have the data going all the way back to the start, is the establishment of a common discussion. Uh, sometimes people call that leveling the playing field. Um, uh, students come to Stanford like strangers to each other. People come to work at Stanford like strangers to each other. There's a lot of estrangement in modern life. Right? We have to, uh, and some of this is uh, not my responsibility. My responsibility is to, uh, to, to to, to, to enable students to talk to each other, to talk to each other intelligently and to learn from each other. Uh, and that's what should go on in the discussion section. I think the goal of the discussion section, this is real progressive education, uh, is not mastery of the material at all. It's the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the facilitating and the achievement of successful discussion which includes successful learning processes. Uh, what concerned me in reading the student responses uh, in the IHAM self-study was the extent of vitriol that students would reserve, not for the faculty and not for the fellows, but for each other. Uh, <laughs> They can't stand that other student droning on. Right? I come to Stanford to hear the expert, not to hear someone else. Right? I want to have the knowledge given to me. I don't want to engage with someone else in order to achieve it. And I think that it's our responsibility to get them to understand that they have to engage with each other. The problem is they don't like each other. That's okay. Most people don't like each other. Let's, you know, let, let, let's, let's understand. We, we, we have to go into this with, 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 with a realistic assessment of, uh, of human nature. Uh, and, and, and this led to what was, you know, in a sense, the most uh, mechanical response, but I think the most successful response uh, out of the I am self-study, which was the reduction of the um, length of the section from 90 minutes uh, to 50 minutes. Let me point out that the original Senate legislation 10 years ago, t t 10 years or so past, was um, mandated two 50-minute lectures per week and two discussion sections of at least 90 minutes each. Yeah, and I, literary scholar, drone, uh, hone in on that at least. And this indicates to me that 10 years ago, there must have been some minority in the faculty who thought that 90 minutes wasn't enough. Damn it, we're going to keep these people captive for 120 minutes, and we're going to force Plato down their throats. Right? <laughs> right? This is not good education. Uh, and it turns out that the 90 minutes was, uh, was too long. I have no doubt that many fellows could conduct great 90-minute sections. But there was a significant number of undergraduates for whom that 90 minutes just strained attention span. 
really aggravated um, hostility to each other. Right? You know, if they're already not liking each other, why keep them together for 90 minutes? Just do it 50 minutes. Every 50 minutes is the currency of the realm here. So to burden a freshman requirement with the albatross of, of a hypertrophic section duration uh, is, 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 is really a, uh, a killer. Um, again, I think you know, some people, some sections probably worked really well. It depends on the chemistry of who's in the room. It depends on the, uh, the, uh, the, the skill of the um, section leader. But I am happy with reports that students now leave their 50-minute sections wishing that they had been able to stay there longer than the reports of students having uh, uh, snoozed through the last 20 minutes of the 90-minute section. Uh, this, is, uh, this is controversial, but I think that that has reduced the, point, the, 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 the opportunities for irritation. Uh, there was also just something uh, pragmatic about it that 90 minutes twice a week killed student schedules. And this really uh, put front and center the question of, how come I have to spend 90 minutes in this required course when there's this other lab that I want to go to and I can't take it because there's a 20 minute overlap? Uh, the, uh, I re this is a real good example of less is more. Uh, but there's another aspect to the, uh, the, uh, the common discussion problem. Uh, uh, again, I think this was probably always a problem. Uh, this is probably always an issue. People always came to Stanford as strangers, and people always disliked each other. Uh, but uh, we face a, a new situation today for um, a complex set of reasons. Uh, I think that, um, uh, well, I know that Stanford has been very successful, I think more successful than our East Coast peers, uh, in admitting a um, diverse undergraduate population. This means students come from very different high school backgrounds as well. They're entering Stanford with different, level, different, different types of preparation, different familiarity with the sorts of texts that are being taught. Uh, and this is a challenge to pedagogy and for the success for the discussion. It's, add to that aside from the, the question of Stanford admissions policies, add to that the um, uh, increasing, uh, increasingly, uh, you know, to, say, to, to say diverse is, uh, it would be cynical, but the increasingly hierarchical character of K through 12 education in the United States from which most undergraduates still come. Lots of international students, but most come up from the United States. And most come from a, from a K through 12 system where public education is under enormous pressure and you get under-resourced schools, and you have enormously successful over-resourced schools, and students come from both. This was a real source of student-to-student uh, of, uh, -student hostility. Again and again, I would read comments by students, why do we have to ask this question? We were doing MLA-level research in, in sophomore in the high school I went to. Why do I have to sit next to somebody who, uh, uh, who can't write a two-page essay? Uh, there's, a, there's a big social class issue going on here, right? or at least um, uh, a big issue regarding which high school uh, you came from, which maps significantly onto, onto social class, if not, if not, if not fully. Um, the, um, the, if the university wants to um, draw on students with diverse high school background, then this university has a responsibility to develop a pedagogy that addresses that. Frankly, this doesn't apply to, to sort of the, the IHUM uh, venue. I think that uh, there are probably some majors currently constructed at Stanford that are inaccessible to some students given their high school preparation. Uh, and you know, that's, I think that, that borders on, dis, uh, on, on structural discrimination. Uh, there ought to be uh, a way for any student entering Stanford to have access to any major of, you know, with correction for individual talents. Some people just don't have the quantitative capacity. Some people don't have the, the qualitative capacity. But it shouldn't be on the, because of which high school you come from that you can't major in such and such a field. Um, let me uh, quote from the final paragraphs of the, uh, of the report. 
in the course of this self-study, we encountered evidence of a larger challenge for college education in general, which impacts IHUM directly. IHUM provides an all-freshman learning experience that facilitates the transition to college while also contributing to forging of friendships and integration into the Stanford community. So this is a little vanilla. I mean, I didn't talk about how people hate each other. But, uh, yeah. but you know, if I, if I say, yeah, the fact that I emphasize friendship means there's something else going on in my mind. Uh, debates over such required courses, whatever form they take, typically mix discussions of specific academic goals with the intention to provide a common experience. This vision of a shared learning process implies a community in which students collaborate with each other in discussion rather than a mere association of isolated recipients of professorial knowledge. Many students do in fact find that community through IHUM, the all-freshman class that brings students with diverse backgrounds and interests together to work through important problems of interpretation. Some students also report how the IHAM discussions spill over into the residence halls. Okay, so that's the good news. That's, that's the party line. It's true. But um, many students appreciate these discussions, but many do not. In our questionnaire, students ranked discussion with other students lowest among the various components of the courses. This is grounds for concern. At the very least, we should not lose sight of the cultural pressures that work against the curricular goal of a common experience. Students have particular interests, and many would prefer to pursue them narrowly, rather than listen to students with other points of view and disciplinary goals. These centrifugal forces of specialization pull at the cohesion of any common experience. So really, these, the, the, this, 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 the issue, IHUM is really just a microcosm of American society in that sense, right? Uh, yeah, there's, yeah, we think we should be a democratic community, and in fact, you know, we're all flying off into our own particular eccentricities. Uh, these uh, uh, commonality is especially fragile in the absence of a canon, a set of specific works, values, or ideas which once appeared rightly or wrongly to define our culture. So that's not an argument for a return to the canon, but it's an it's a, it's a exhortation to reflect on the consequences of given, giving up that um, institutionalized commonality. And I, I mean, I think it'd be, it's, it's ridiculous to imagine that we could, we, we could return to that or should return to that. That's not my point at all. But I don't think it's a, it was an inconsequential decision to move to multiple tracks uh, with no shared reading. Although, in fact, it turns out there is a lot of shared reading in the, in the, in the curricula that are proposed. Um, uh, canon, which once appeared rightly or wrongly to define our culture. Today, even that possessive adjective is controversial. The grand wager of IHUM is that we can still maintain a common experience without the traditionalist foundation the canon once provided. That is, can you have a non-traditionalist common discussion? Um, uh, the common experience today is by no means harmonious or stable. Not only do specialization pressures challenge commonality, so do so. It's part of it is just individualism and the pursuit of individual careers, but so do very real differences in high school preparation, reflecting an increasingly stratified secondary educational system. These tensions translate into critiques of the IHUM program, which bears the brunt of the transition to college. Like Stanford, IHUM brings together heterogeneous students and tries to develop a level playing field and a shared discussion, developing an, developing an appropriate pedagogy to improve the quality of discussion among diverse participants is the most important goal for the program at this juncture. So that's where the, the self-study uh, ended up. Let me talk just a little bit more now about some of the bigger implications for, for liberal arts. Uh, uh, to, um, to, re to rethink the liberal arts uh, agenda in, uh, in college education means focusing on exactly what we mean. Uh, uh, it's the it's the, the non-pre-professional 
component of, of, uh, of the curriculum. It's the non-pre-professional component of the courses students take. It's the, also the, the non-expert engagement with knowledge. Now, of course, when students take a course with a faculty member outside of their um, uh, pre-professional domain, they're working with an expert, to be sure. But what's the nature of the relationship of the student to that, to the, to, uh, to, to that faculty member? Uh, the question is, when I teach undergraduates in literature, there's some number of those students for whom it is de facto pre-professional, because they have every intent to go on to graduate school, to get a PhD, and to become uh, an academic. I certainly hope that that's a small percentage of the students that I teach, both because of the job market for the ones whose goal that is, and also because, to get the denominator right, I'd like to have larger classes. Uh, uh, but but, but, the, but the, the, the real question is, what's the substance? What am I trying to do with these students? They're not just uh, there, the, the, the students who aren't going on to graduate school. They're there not to become professional readers of literature. They're there for some other set of reasons. And how should I think about that? What am I, I don't think what I'm doing, what I should be doing them, for them is giving them a taste of what the scholarly life is about. I think that's a possible position. And I know colleagues who think that is, that think that that's what it's right. But I think, that, I think, I think it's wrong. I think there's a non-disciplinary engagement with material that can be serious. Uh, I think IHUM is a place where that is institutionalized. One of the main challenges of, uh, of uh, directing IHUM is getting faculty involved to understand that this is not just a recruiting pool for future majors and future graduate students. That is to say, these aren't disciplinary courses. There's, they're, I use the term pre-disciplinary, but maybe that's even too much of a concession. It should be an engagement with uh, this material that elicits a, uh, a, a, a wise thinking uh, on the part of the students about this, so that students who never take a course in this field again because of other interests not because they're turned off, but just because they're, they're, they go so well, will we'll have an appreciation for what's it mean to read literature. Not what's it mean to, how do I do an MLA bibliography. Right? Right? Not, not how do I, how do I uh, 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 get the latest literary theory, or more likely, the literary theory of 15 years ago. But, uh, but how do I engage with this aesthetic experience smartly? Um, I think it's, ha having said that, I think it's important that we, that we, the faculty, the higher education community, think about uh, the value of this non-expert knowledge uh, because it, um, it does have, it, it comes at a very significant cost. I'm very uh, attentive to the structural consequences of any argument for anything in higher education given the costs of, uh, of higher education to, um, to students and their, their families. Uh, we can talk about enrichment. We can talk about breadth. We can talk about uh, the kind of liberal generosity of the spirit, all of which I believe is true. But others say, you know, this is just dilettantism. This is non-expertise. Why don't we just fast forward students toward a, toward a, toward a career track? And frankly, yeah, I think we have a, uh, uh, a real test case of an alternative model, and that is uh, the sort of higher education that prevails in most European countries. In most European countries, they don't do IHUM. They don't do liberal arts. What they do is they get their uh, their, their, their abitur, they get their uh, baccalaureate, they get their, their, their yeah, their high school degree plus a year, right? and then they're yeah. then they go to law school, right? Then they go to medical school, and they dabble a little bit, but they're, they're they they specialize directly, and that's an alternative model. I think, and this uh, Michelle uh, uh, quoted my um, 
referred to my book in anti-Americanism. I think this is one of the real sources of the cultural divide between, uh, between Europe and the United States. That's another discussion. But uh, uh, I think that one of the successes of liberal arts education in the United States is establishing a, um, is the establishment of a discussion culture, an expectation to listen to other people and to, uh, to take other points of view seriously. Sometimes it may even get too fluffy. But I think that whether you come out of Stanford or whether you come out of a community college in the United States, there's a liberal arts ethos that, uh, that, that, that lets you know that you're supposed to be able to participate in discussion. And I don't think you get that in Europe, where it's much more focused on the maintenance of elite expertise. Other discussion. Still, this is enor it's enormously costly, this non-expert stuff that we do. It, uh, burdens families with, uh, with an enormous amount of debt. In fact, one could, art, one could write the history of higher education in the United States right now and say that our major contribution is to saddle the middle class with enormous debt. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's become a political issue. You can read today's daily editorial. You can, read, uh, you can listen to any of the candidates in the, in the campaign. Um, it's, uh, I don't think it's uh, prima facie evident that, uh, that, uh, that, that it makes sense for universities with endowments of this size to be able to continue to distribute tax deductions to those who are wealthy enough to make contributions, which is another way to look at this. Probably the real revolution in education in the United States would be if we were to just cap uh, 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 philanthropic donations to, to colleges and universities and instead redirect that flow to K through 12. That would, uh, that, that would, that would change everything. Uh, beyond that, I think uh, the, uh, the, the liberal arts component adds time, surely, to a degree. It probably adds a year. Uh, we could have the three-year degree if we dropped the liberal arts uh, stuff and just went into the major. Um, so where's the benefit if we have all of, um, all of those negatives, all of those costs? Uh, I think it's useful to think about the, the, the historical development of this. Um, the, uh, we've moved from an older model of cultural capital, Western culture, knowing stuff that identified your standing in society, to one of um, uh, cognitive skills, ability to think, to think with agility, to, uh, to argue, and to discuss. Uh, I think all of that could be mapped onto a trajectory from the progressive educational agenda of the early 20th century uh, onto kind of postmodern, post fortis structure of society uh, today. That's, that's in part just a metaphor, but I think it does provide a, uh, a good road map. Uh, once upon a time, there was a one-size-fits-all requirement, uh, uh, the university as factory. Uh, it's given way to a celebration of diversity, which in a sense has become a celebration of individual creativity, uh, to what I see as emerging now as the desideratum, which is an educational model of supple networks, uh, which would imply smaller classes, uh, a variety of learning styles, uh, less authority, and a greater interactivity among students. Um, let, me, uh, let me skip some of this and um, just come up with uh, six provocations about rethinking liberal arts, and then we can open up the, the discussion. Uh, some of this from IAM, some of this through IAM filtered through my other thoughts about uh, liberal arts education. Uh, first, I think we should um, change courses to incorporate more teamwork and group projects. Uh, uh, in the, uh, when all is said and done, in the end, it's still um, you know, the, the, the course is the confessional. I mean, you get, uh, you know, it's, you know how, how sinful have you been? Uh, and I think that, that what, if we're preparing students for this world, it should be about uh, interaction. There's need to provide guidance in this. Uh, that's a way to think about the, the role of the faculty member. Uh, teamwork begins in that discussion. That's, that's teamwork. But it, we, ha we should think more about our expectations for what students are doing outside of uh, times and spaces where there are faculty 
um, policing them. Uh, that is, in IHAM, we have the lecture and we have the section. In both cases, we have instructors. But can't we imagine students interacting significantly outside of these uh, surveilled environments? Uh, faculty you know, can remain as, a, as expert resource. They can manage these, uh, these processes. And we have to develop some kind of evaluation system that, uh, that encourages this. The grading system is just a, you know, this is the, the dead weight of the past that has you know, zero meaning anymore except to make lives difficult and bitter. Uh, uh, it's, 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 I'm not sure if it's as broken as the counting units system, but both of these denominations are just, at, you know, this is Confederate currency in both cases. They just get in the way of, of real education. Uh, uh, I think we should, um, I mean, one of the big issues, secondly, uh, has to do with uh, the, the sense that the reduction to the 50 minutes in IHAM uh, made it more difficult to teach writing, and I'm sure that it did. But I think the problem is that we have to expect progress in oral and written skills, including the skill to participate in discussion, but writing specifically across the curriculum constantly. Right? I mean, we, we, we have these, these homilies about the importance of writing, and then we sequester it into a couple of courses in freshman year, and then these WIM courses. As, and I suspect that there are plenty of courses where students don't write at all. And you know, that's a real problem. If we're serious about writing, they should be writing constantly, and there should be a way to coach that and monitor that, and uh, the university should uh, train faculty appropriately. Uh, third, uh, we should uh, build um, courses um, and course projects that have continuity over time, which means building links between students currently enrolled in a course and students previously enrolled in a course. Uh, if you imagine courses organized more around group projects, why not make last year's group projects online available to this year's group projects with this year's students who then could interact with their predecessors rather than trying to begin each course uh, uh, ab ovo uh, and um, it, you know, in a more sober way that would mean enlisting former students as tutors uh, formally informally uh, uh, in the um, educational process of those who have come after them. Uh, Fourthly, um, and this will, uh, if this hasn't pissed you off yet, this will. Uh, 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 I mean, if, you, if you buy my notion of teamwork, if you buy your, my, my notion of, uh, of supple networks, uh, then what we really have to do is a massive reutilization of campus space. Uh, I think that we should give up on private faculty studies and replace them with open workspaces with, uh, with flexible workstations. Uh, I've, uh, mo it's, it's, it's an enormous uh, real estate waste since most faculty don't do most of their work in their study. You all know what Palo Alto real estate costs. We have all this underutilized space that we're devoting to this myth of the individual professor working there. Right? That's not what happens. Uh, we, uh, it's a, uh, enough said. Uh, I, I, well, no, not enough said, because I think these private studies model a kind of isolation which, uh, which, um, uh, which, which counteracts the message of, uh, of collaboration. Uh, and now to make matters worse, uh, I think, uh, fifthly, we should put as much of the library collection online as copyright allows. Right? Um, have to respect copyright. That's important. Uh, uh, but as much as, uh, as, as we can legally do should be online. Um, once it's online, though, I think that it only makes sense to make that accessible um, to the wide public. There's no reason to restrict it to the campus community. Um, so the uh, digitization of the library collection does have a genuine dem democratization potential that uh, your library card uh, withheld. Um, I, I also think that we ought to, f uh, attendant to that, figure out a way to allow for responsible commentary online. That is, imagine you, know, you get something from the library online and you get like the Amazon reviews. A lot of problems with that, but I think there's a way to develop discussion around material uh, uh, that, um, 
could um, enhance online community uh, on online communities around texts that uh, are otherwise read serially by individuals who have no knowledge of each other. Right? Sometimes you get a book in the library and you see when it was last taken out. You have no idea who that was. Right? It's all, um, yeah. Homeland Security does, but you don't, right? Uh, and uh, you know, what if there are a way to, to, to post? What if there are a way to take marginal notes right, in an, on an online text and leave them there for the next reader to look at or not to look at? Um, and finally, um, I think uh, we, we should uh, rethink the, um, the requirement structure for the degree in the following sense. Uh, we have some general education requirements, and then students have to complete the requirements for majors. Um, uh, people who are critical of IHAM should be vigilant that if it is changed, it is not simply occupied by another set of requirements, because any other specific set of requirements is going to be reactionary, since IHAM allows for everything and any other set of requirements might mandate, would, might, might be a de facto return to the old cano, can, canonic mentality. All students have to know this in order to be an educated person in our world because of the absolute importance of why today. We shouldn't go there. Um, but I really meant something different. Not the gen ed side of it, but the major side of it. I think most majors are structured like, um, uh, uh, baby graduate programs. Right? You, know, you got to major in this in order to go to graduate school in it. And this is nuts because many students don't do that. Uh, why not have much reduced major requirements and allow students to um, choose widely across the university? We can advise those students who want to go on to graduate school that you should do the straight and narrow if that's your intention. But I wish we could recognize that students who come out of college with a BA aren't necessarily condemned to graduate school or, uh, or professional school, that there's a life to be lived. And um, we ought to give them the uh, cognitive skills, the, right, the communitive skills that enable them to um, succeed there. Questions, comments? Sure. I like you, Russell. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, your, your comment in some way disturbs me about, about our freshmen not liking one another. You know, and, and there's probably some real reality to that. The, the, the serious question is, how do they learn, maybe not to like one another, but part of what you're talking about in terms of this discussion is a tolerance, an acceptance, a willingness to explore ideas. Where does that happen then? Yeah, I, I don't know that all students don't like each other. But I was, but going into this, you know, I, 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 I assumed a kind of you know smile face icon freshman class, and I was surprised to find that 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 component, that darker side, that uh, that that hostility to one another. Um, you know, I mean, it comes up in the. Um, uh, in the in the in the public culture, with this stereotype of the IHUM kid, do you know this? From uh, the IHUM kid is the is the is the kid who talks too much in the IHUM class, right? And he, he's, he, and the IHUM kid is he she is a butt of jokes in student performances and student papers, uh, uh, and it's uh, and and it the IHUM kid has a kind of um, uh, I don't know, uh, Mr. Rogers continuity you know, over the years. Uh, uh, and you know, it's funny, but I, I think it, 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 we, we should you know, div direct a kind of uh, critical theoretical investigation of this caricature of the student who dares to speak. Right? Uh, the, 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 the hostility to the IHUM kid really indicates uh, that the community is prepared to come together to sanction someone who dares to articulate himself, herself, in the, in the public. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't IHAM kids who are real bores. Right? It's not to say that there are people who dominate conversations, who, 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 who talk too much. But I think there's something else going on there. 
that said, uh, we, we do know that a lot of friendships are, are formed in, in IHAM uh, and in, in the predecessor courses. So I've, met, I've met alumni from, you know, even older than me, who, uh, who, who, who married the person they were in their, their freshman class with. And so this, there's, there's something else going on there, too. I don't know. I guess uh, um, uh, I, I don't have a prescription for this, uh, but we have to be attentive to it. Uh, there's probably a certain amount of uh, estrangement that is uh, uh, inescapable in the human condition. I think it's amplified by the pressures of Stanford and the, um, the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the tensions of the current K through 12 um, situation in the United States. Yes? Good point. Uh, you talked about I have as an implicit ramp up. Is any of that? ramp up and the reasons for it made explicit and discussed explicitly just really out there with the students. This is all about we're not you're learning now, we're not teaching, etc. Uh, I hope so. I mean it's it's in our literature and the um, the the uh, again the structure of IHUM is that we that, is that faculty propose courses that our governance board approves, um, and we try to direct faculty to certain practices, but you know, footnote, the, the issue here is management of faculty. Right? Uh, you know, end of that footnote. Uh, I, I exhort faculty to, to, to say that they should begin the class explaining what this is about. Uh, and I think that most faculty now do give that kind of meta narrative about IHUM to some extent. Michelle? To build a little bit on that, you did talk about pedagogical approaches and training and responsibilities a lot in your talk. But if you are hoping that faculty will teach in a more collaborative, project based, small class way, um, most of them are used to the lecture format. They have a lot of control over time and how things go. It's very easy to prepare a lecture when you know how to do it, you know your field, versus walking into a classroom and hoping to get a collaborative discussion going. So to what extent do you think the faculty could make a transition from the way most have been teaching to what I think is your vision of a better kind of teaching and learning? Through CTL. <laughs> uh, uh, um, I, I, there's a, um, I mean, some of the part that I skipped here, I think there's a, uh, I mean, there's a real tension between um, uh, the, the structure of scholarship as it's currently organized. Um, not only in the United States, um, probably probably less so in the United States than elsewhere. Uh, we're relatively good on this stuff, um, uh, and this kind of teaching uh, agenda. And the the deep question is uh, the relationship between um, between uh, established expertise and um, innovative creativity. Uh, established expertise is good because it really knows stuff. Huh? Established expertise is bad because it can be um, uh, arrogant and hidebound. Huh? Uh, uh, innovative creativity is great because you get new ideas. Huh? It can also just become eccentric and 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 weird. Huh? Uh, I, I mean, I think I think you know, seriously. I think uh, one of the um, you know, w w I'm not sure if we still do it, but in you know, in recent Years the 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 the, um, the rhetoric coming out of Stanford was about follow your passion right and engage in research uh, right away right? and my objection isn't that yeah they didn't know enough of the basics to engage in research but it leads student it invites students to um, reify their own eccentric obsessions because they haven't had an opportunity to um, to confront them with alternative positions yet. So that they know that, gee, you know, here's this one thing that I've always been interested in, and it may not be that interesting, but they've never had, they've never had to defend that, and 
I think there are ways to get around it. Maybe we just need better processes. But uh, uh, so, so while, while all of this uh, argument for how education ought to work is uh, critical of expertise, I, 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 I don't think we should lose sight of the, the other side. There, are, there has to be a way to, to, to integrate the importance of expertise without becoming a departmental reactionary. I, I talked about the, the unit counting and I talked about the grading system. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think the departmental structure is, is part of the problem as well. Uh, uh, the, the, the one argument for the departmental structure that I can't get around is that it's basically a, um, a labor management issue for the university as employer right, to make sure that faculty show up. Right? Uh, yeah, I, but I don't think that it makes a particularly good contribution to the production of knowledge or, or the, the enhance, enhancement of, of learning, uh, especially as we move toward you know, more and more interdisciplinary projects. Uh, the, um, the departmental structure uh, uh, just seems to, you know, you know, should go the way of the manor. Yes? Together, the idea of students not liking each other and the, the level of expertise that, that has to take its place in, in, a, in a discussion course. It, it seems to me that some of this is based on the developmental level of students as not liking each other because they're not the experts. I'm not an expert and I don't even like me, so you know, how could I like you and, and because you're not the expert? To what extent can, can college students, particularly freshmen, truly move developmentally that quickly into questioning the expertise, questioning the authority, being willing to entertain the lack of absoluteness? Oh, I think, I mean, I think that's the, 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 the mission, that should be the mission of IHAM, that should be the mission of uh, freshman education. That is, you know, six months before coming to Stanford, uh, uh, students were being, um, interpolated with the epistemology of getting SAT questions right. right? Uh, and in fact, the world's more complex. Right? Uh, and that's, that's the one thing they should learn in freshman year, that it's not about answering SAT questions. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I, I suppose the, um, the well, uh, no, I, I, I think we, th this, is, this has been part of the discussion about IHOM for 10 years explicitly that it was an invitation to students to participate in the production of knowledge. That's how it was talked about 10 years ago. I wouldn't use exactly that terminology, but I think it's basically okay. Uh, that, uh, and there's a, there, there's probably, there are probably developmental, psychological development aspects to that, but I think we should not lose sight of the, uh, the larger um, social historical issues at stake. What, what, uh, the, 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 um, the second half of the 20th century marked a crisis in the authority of professorial expertise. And there's no way we're going to return to the status quo ante, nor should we. Uh, we should try to understand why that happened. Uh, uh, and uh, there were there were, there were bad versions of the crisis of, of, uh, of uh, professorial expertise, the Cultural Revolution in China. Right? But that's exactly what this was about. Right? Uh, there, were, there, were, there, were, there were good versions of that, and that is the transformation of aspects of higher education in the United States. But this is, what, this is really what's going on. Uh, there's a, there's, there's a, there's an, we've moved into a, an, a regime of economy that allows for enormous amount of innovation and creativity. And to some extent, it's about deregulation. Right? To so, some extent, it's about deregulation of the mind. And, uh, uh, and, and departments and the grading system uh, uh, collaborate. This is the, uh, the, uh, the holy alliance right? to, to get in the way of, uh, of, uh, of student creativity. And uh, we should figure out responsible ways to, to move beyond that. Of our allotted time, I'm afraid. So please join me in thanking Russell.